The elders are going to make the final decision. If I serve up an internal candidate, they might go, you like them, we don't. Sorry. It's the elder's decision. So no internal candidate, external candidate. When we eventually find an external candidate, then there's another, I think it's 18 months, where we will actually do the transition where I have to help them uh, under, or introduce them to the congregation, uh, tell, tell them that he's better than me and do all those kinds of things. And then they put me on an ice floe and they push me out on the sea. Okay? Any questions about that? But th these are the important, if you ask me, these are the important elements of a successful transition plan. Planning phase, the uh, internal candidate, external candidate, transition time, out. Okay? So if you just need a format to think about it, some of you just need to go to your elders. Your elders need to come to you and say, let's start. No rush. Let's just start the planning phase. Uh, can I give you a little extra credit information on this? Extra credit? Uh, why, do, why do many pastors hang on too long? A, a lot of people, you know what a lot of people the congregation will say? Ego. It's ego, it's pride, it's control. It's not. I know thousands of pastors. Very few of them have massive egos. You want to know why most pastors hang on longer than they should? The first is the day they stop, they're broke. They've never, most pastors never made big money. Most churches don't take care of pastors' retirement. Most pastors have led campaigns where they had to give a sacrificial gift. You know, I've, I've, I've made lifetime gifts five times in my life, you know what I mean? So, uh, so a lot of times pastors realize, hey, next Sunday, if, I mean, if I resign this week, I have no income the rest of my life. What am I going to do? That's okay. Uh, the other thing is equally as important. I've only been a pastor my whole life. They have an identity, ID, an identity issue. What am I going to do? I'm only going to be like 64 years old, and the only thing I've done since I was a kid is preach. What I, I have no identity outside of my church. So what our elders did is they said, uh, during this whole process, and, and again, I can't be totally specific with you about this, but they said, we want to make sure that we treat you in a fashion financially so that when you finally are done, that you don't probably have to go out and beg on the corner. And so they said, we will fix the money part. Not, I'm not going to be a wealthy man, but I, you know, they'll help me with this. This, they said, that's your problem. You have to figure out, it's not our problem, it's your problem to figure out what you're going to be, what you're going to be when you grow up. And when you're done at Willow, if you want to become a senior pastor at another church, that's good. Can't be close to Willow for obvious reasons. And I wouldn't want it to be. But you have to fix that. We will help you fix that. But it's not a bad thing if you're starting to reach, you know, a certain age and you've been with your church for a certain length of time. This is a really beautiful plan in general, and you better really think about those two things. Okay? Yes? Uh, number one, uh, what is the approximate length for this planning exercise? Excellent question. What is the length of this planning exercise? Um, it can, well, so like, uh, all right, my, my short answer is it it should be whatever length of time is appropriate for both the elders and the pastor to come to agreement on a good plan. If the pastor wants to rush a plan and the board is feeling nervous, that's not good. If the board is rushing the plan and the pastor is feeling nervous, not good. 
So uh, Jack Welsh, he used to run uh, General Electric. Uh, he started eight years. He started his planning and thinking about this eight years before he retired. That's a long time. Um, but even in my situation, uh, from this point where I signed, I actually signed a document. At the end of our planning, uh, I signed my name, all the elders signed a name, we have a document. From here to when they push me out on the ice floe, okay, this is uh, more, than, more than five years and it's less than 10 years. So I have a little more than five years to go, but I have less than 10 years. That's, I can't reveal more than that or I'd have to kill you. <laughs> yes, over here. Yes. Uh, we need to anticipate time and pick people. So, um... Well, we do not have that many people in church that can invest that much time to make yep. so many friends for prolonged periods of time. So structurally or organizationally, uh, something has to be done to make this uh, sustainable. How, how is it done in Willow Creek? Okay. Yeah. So what I want to do is hold that question. To just we'll get to it unless there's one more question on this, because I want to make sure that we're done with this, and then we'll, sw uh, we'll switch to that one, because I love that question, okay? Sorry, my question number two is about the money part. Yep. Uh, it is so good that the pastors can talk about the pastor's yep. retirement, but we don't need to hear that. The elders and the deacons need to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> they do. Is there anything written from the elder's perspective so that we can yes. translate it? Okay, and, okay. You know. but there, there is one. No, you're absolutely right because elders are going to decide the financial future of all of these pastors and they have, they have no guidebook. Okay? Okay. So there's a book in the United States and it's called uh, Transition Plan. Two words. Transition Plan plan. It was written by a pastor named Bob Russell. Transition plan, Bob Russell. Get it on Amazon. You can receive it here. It, it's what I consider to be the gold standard. It's, th there are very few books that have been written about this, and this is actually intelligently and thoughtfully written, and it's what our elders at Willow Creek read before they started this, Bob's a good friend of mine, and while we did not follow all of the counsel in that book, it gave us a, a place to start, okay? It gave us a place to start. Now, you, you want to really get messy? Who wants to really get messy with this? Really? You really? Okay. Um, what that book will get into and what you'll get into with this planning thing here is uh, if you raise up an internal candidate, okay, th a couple of the sticky points is, is going to be can you stay around the church after your successor takes your place? Th this is a very important question that has to be resolved. Now, um, I, I can tell you this publicly, other things I can't tell you because we decided to keep it confidential. My elders asked and I gladly agreed to not attend the weekend services at Willow for 12 months after I leave. Now, it, 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 I'm not being banned or censured. It's just that my presence... When I walk into our auditorium, you know, I, I will have been there 42 years. So, you know, I walk in and they wonder how I'm walking that day. And they go, he doesn't look happy. Oh, he looks happy today. He likes what's going on. He doesn't like what's going on. They watch my body language. They watch, they watch everything. The, one of the best gifts that I can give to my successor is to just be curiously absent you know, for a year, and we'll explain it to the whole congregation and say, you know, Bill's not mad. You know, he's, he's just, he wants to make it easier 
for one year. And then after that, I can come back and attend services and be a volunteer in the church if that's the way God leads my life. So that, what, like, should you attend the church the year afterwards? That, okay. Can you play any significant role without undermining the new pastor? These, you have to agree and sort this out. And, it, you know, you got to be clear on it at the end of the day. Okay? Any other questions about this? I don't want to leave this and open up something else until we feel like we're done with this. But, okay. What are the disadvantages of the internal search and the external search are being done simultaneously? Yep. The, it's, you're a very insightful man. Okay, I have five candidates who really, really would like the challenge of leading our church when I'm done. They really would. I've talked with all five. If they know that right now I'm also talking to uh, Andy Stanley and Craig Groeschel and Rick Warren and all these other people, <laughs> they go, Bill's not taking my candidacy seriously. So I've told them, I'm not looking externally, and I won't look externally until we figure out if any of you can do it. And I'm devising, designing, I should say, I'm designing a level playing field where all five of these can candidate in a way, here's my theory on this, I want them to be able to candidate in a way that is so fair that God will lift up the person who is supposed to be the next pastor, not some inequity in the system. You follow me? So it's a little tricky, but we're making progress on it. Another thing about this money deal, like Bob says in his book, that what a lot of churches are doing is if a pastor has built the church and they've been around for a long time, they sometimes the elders decide that they will pay some form of compensation to the pastor as long as he lives, okay? Just as a way of showing honor for what the pastor built. Um, that's what Bob Russell in his book describes, and that's one way you can do it. Uh, there, we're thinking in our approach there may be a better way than that for all different kinds of reasons, but... I guess all I want to say is this, nobody should, should simply follow a prescribed formula. It ought to be unique to your church in a way that's appropriately honoring uh, for your pastor, okay? And it has to be clean enough that if your congregation found out about it, they would all stand up and cheer instead of leave and call it, you know, a, um, a scam, Okay. You don't want the last thing that you do to create bad blood after you've given 30 or 40 years of your life to your church. Okay, okay we're done with this now? Five, four, three, two, one. We're going to my brother's question here. And his question was, if we're going to create friends and not just be friendly, then we're gonna, uh, that's going to require time for some people to actually, you know, Build friendships with these people. Now, <laughs> when you were asking the question, I thought, oh, he's going to hate my answer. <laughs> and I, so I'm bracing you. You're going to hate my answer. If a Christ follower is too busy to build a new friendship, I think they're too busy. I just, I, I think some pastor has to stand up and say, hey, wait a minute. We, we're, we're not saying you have to marry this person, you don't have to invite, you don't have to adopt them. We're not even saying you have to golf with them every week. We're simply saying that you would care for their interests, that you would make a phone call, have a cup of coffee every other week, or, or just establish some routine of friendliness so that when they show up, you know, there's warmth. 